uh, I've spent quite some hours already. Uh, I think all of you on YouTube searching for a thing, how does it work? And uh, usually PyData movies are, are quite uh, good to, to get a first feel for everything. And yeah, really, uh, I hope that, that today I will inspire you to, to do the same thing. So um, yeah, what we're gonna talk about is uh, data pipelines. Um, I'll, I'll uh, give a quick introduction about myself. Then we'll talk about data pipelines. I have some five tips basically that I wanna share. And then uh, part of those tips are, are uh, Delta Lake. And then I'll go into a demo. So, so uh, yeah, fingers crossed that everything uh, works out. Um, and, and then uh, of course there's time for some questions. And I have to do it low key because it's not working. So <laughs> we'll, we'll do it like this. So uh, who am I? My name is Geert Jonge. I'm a data engineer, data scientist at Pipple. Um, basically, I started out as an industrial engineer 10 years ago. I, I graduated in 2012. And at that point, I, have, I never heard of data engineer or data scientist. Uh, I, I don't know how it's with you guys, but, but at that point, it was all fairly new. And uh, basically, yeah, throughout my, my yeah, in those years, I, I moved into that position without calling it that. And then in the end, I realized, yeah, this is really the name that covers it. Um, and yeah, right now I'm, I'm basically uh, with Pipple. I'm doing the Pipple pipelines, and that's basically projects we do with data pipelines. So at, at different companies, uh, yeah, we develop pipelines, and that can be small pipelines, big, uh, yeah, whatever is needed to get the job done, basically. Um, and yeah, it's just a very short note on Pipple. Yeah, Pipple is a small company uh, located here in Eindhoven. We actually have a new office. Um, and we're doing uh, yeah, data engineering, data science uh, I yeah, as, as a broad uh, topic. So uh, that's, that's about Pipple. Data pipelines. Who of you has heard of the term data pipelines? I guess every, everyone uh, currently now has it. Um, uh, can, can, can you tell me something about data pipelines, what, what you think of? If that, uh, uh, infrastructure. infrastructure, yeah, definitely. It has an infrastructure part to it. Um, could, you, could you tell me something? What, what? Metadata. Metadata, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, you? Delivering data from A to B. Yeah, yeah, that's my A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, 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 good, yeah. good. You, you picked it up, very smart. Uh, yeah, so, Jeroen, um, you can uh, do it once. Yeah, so I, j I just wrote down some, some, some things that for me make up a data pipeline because there's a lot of talk, there are a lot of different versions, basically you can call anything a data pipeline, but for me it feels like y you're moving data from one location to the other. Yeah, the, the, the usually you start with something and you end up with, with something else. Um, often you have like multiple inputs that together make something new, yeah, which, is, which is highly valuable, more valuable than the inputs themselves. Um, you transform data, um, data quality is a big topic that, that we're actually realizing now. Eh? For some time it was a bit to the back, as long as you get more data, uh, things will work out. But I think we're learning now that, that data quality is really important and, and you, you, yeah, sometimes more data will not solve your problem. Eh? You need better data. Um, data versioning is a big one. So, so um, yeah, as a data scientist, you're highly uh, yeah, relying on history. Yeah, you need to know what the data was like a, yeah, uh, an hour ago, a day ago, a week ago. Because otherwise, if, if you're just using the data as it is now, you, you, it's very easy to have data leakage. Yeah, things that, that you know now, and then if you start predicting stuff with things you know now, yeah, it's, it's of course very easy to, uh, to do that. So d data versioning is important. And um, yeah, scheduling, I think the, we, we all agree a pipeline, usually you build it for more than once. Uh, you're not gonna build a pipeline to do it once and then uh, throw the whole thing away. Jeroen? So, um, well, what's, what, what does it look like then as a whole? Yeah, so, so this is what I took from, uh, from uh, Delta Lake. I'll talk a bit more about it. Um, basically, any, any sort of, of, of data, uh, data platform, data lake will have certain sections, uh, in this case they're calling it bronze, silver, gold, but it might be staging, it might be raw, uh, landing zone, whatever. Um, there are a lot of terms, but we all agree you have to start with the raw data, you're, you're gonna 
move it. Uh, you're going to increase the quality of the data. You're going to you're going to do whatever you need to to get the the, the information out of it uh, that, that you need. And then finally, um, yeah, what what we call gold in this model. This is the data set that you're giving to a different team. Uh, in this case, it would be the data science team uh, most often, but it can be reporting. It could be a simple Excel list, just helping a team to know which clients are problematic, or uh, it can be anything. So, uh, Jeroen, yeah. So, I could talk hours about that previous uh, overview, yeah? uh, go into all the nitty gritty details and, uh, and, and talking about all the ways to set up. But my talk was like, how can we set up data pipelines for data scientists? And for me, it f um, in, in reality, you have a small team, you have limited time, and you do want to get some of these benefits, but you do not have the resources or you don't know if you're going to need the resources to actually build this full-on data platform with all whistles and bells eh, attached to it. So what I'm going to try to show you is a bit like how can we set it up in a way that for a relatively small project, you're still going to get into yeah, the, some of the benefits of that full model, um, but actually using it for yeah, in, in a limited time setting. So, Jeroen, so data pipelines for data scientists. Yeah. So uh, yeah, what, what do I mean by that? So, so you're a data scientist. You are working uh, at a project. Um, well, of course, you're going to receive data in CSV format. Eh? You're not going to uh, get it in a nicely uh, format that has uh, schemas attached to it or anything. Um, you're going to start analyzing the data. Eh? We've had a lot of talks looking into the, the how do you do that, a uh, whole list of packages uh, this morning. So, and you want to work towards that first model to know is, is there actually something happening? Is there actually value eh, in, in my model? Then um, there's a reasonable amount of data. You're busy for one week. And at that point, someone's going to say, well, actually, we just gave you part of the data. So, so we're going to give you more. And yeah, now you're stuck with, with two CSVs that, that, that are eh, a little bit different. So um, I'm going to show you how we're, we might organize this process to, to, uh, to smooth it out. Then. Um, yeah, so first five tips in, in general, and then I'll go into the specifics. So first of all, I think it's really important to have a clear split when you start this, this assignment on what's data engineering and what's data science. Uh, both of them have pipelines. Yeah, both of them uh, have things that, that will help you select columns from a database, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, so try to put the data processing in a data engineering pipeline and everything else with model fit and, and, and uh, normalizing stuff, et cetera, do that in your machine learning pipeline. But yeah, be, be conscious on the decision in which part you're gonna do stuff. The, the easier, the data engineering pipeline, it's quite easy to change some logic and to remove columns, et cetera. Uh, in the in the data science pipeline, so let's say you're using Scikit-Learn to, to uh, it has a pipelines module where, where you can actually select columns and do uh, do a whole lot of things. If you do it in that part, it it will mean that whatever model you choose, you still need to put in all the data because it expects the same input data, uh, whatever you're then doing with it. So, yeah, be conscious about it and 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 try to put the data part in the data engineering pipeline and do not mix them up. Yo. Then, notebooks. I think, yeah, that could be a whole talk as well. Um, I think, yeah, who of you is working with notebooks? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, uh, I think, uh, 70, 80%. Um, well, a lot of the tools uh, that you use, especially the cloud-based ones, they're all around notebooks. And uh, a, new a notebook is very easy the first hour, um, but usually within a day, within a week, you mess it up, you know? It's, it's very easy to, to uh, switch cells, uh, et cetera. So um, force yourself to have simple notebooks. So the flow should always be from top to bottom. I think most of us uh, know that. But also uh, with the data engineering part, you usually have splits. Yeah? There's like this, for, for this model, I'm only interested in clients in the uh, Netherlands or, or I'm only interested in this subgroup. Um, and then you do certain steps only to that subgroup. 
use different notebooks for that. So, um, and then use either an orchestration tool like Apache Airflow or Azure Data Factory. But if you want to do it a little bit low level, just use another notebook, uh, which is very easy. I just, uh, if, and then you just have a Python function need to run, you just run this other notebook. So in that way, you can, you can create complex flows, which, which are still fairly easy to maintain. Uh, each, each notebook in itself is just a regular, yeah, a linear flow of steps. Then naming, uh, this is also such a topic that, that, uh, that, can, uh, that can take quite some time. Um, just start out, have a sit through, take one hour and just decide on how I'm gonna name columns, which uh, am I doing all caps, all lower, um, how I'm gonna name the files, are we using an integer, for example, first notebook, second notebook, third notebook. You know, sit together, uh, it doesn't have to be really complicated, but take the time to decide it and then make sure you follow through, eh, of course, uh, with these things. Um, then, um, very important, all data needs to have a source. So before you start any project and you use any data set, make sure you know who is actually owning the data set. Yeah? Where is it coming from? Um, it, it's really trivial, but it actually isn't because I think there are a lot of companies where data just lives somewhere yeah? and there's an IT person who's, who's managing the database or the application, but they don't, well, they do know what's in there, but they don't know what it means. So you, you need to know before you start using stuff, who is owning it and where can I go with questions? Because they will arise and uh, it wouldn't be the first time that, that you know that you were actually looking at a subset instead of the whole set, for example, which, which uh, can take some time. Uh, for external data, uh, the same principle holds, eh? um, but it's more like, can we trust this party? Um, do they have support? Um, um, and what's, what's their updating frequency? Is it the source or is it, do they actually use their own data logic to, to fill in uh, the gaps, etc.? Uh, all, all sorts of questions you need to ask yourself before you start using the, um, yeah, an external data source. Good, yeah. And then uh, finally, and, and this is where, where I, I will move a bit further, prepare for changes. Because um, I've, I've often started a project that's one-off or that's temporary, and then it's never one-off and it's never temporary. I, I think most of you will recognize it uh, at least once. So. That's why I, I want to give away, like, like with data pipelines as well, you, you are going to run them more often, so build them that way. Yeah, they don't need to be s highly complex, but they need to be runnable, uh, which, which means that you can just run the notebook, it will produce a data set, you rerun it, it will produce the same data set, yeah? uh, or it will do nothing, even better, uh, as long as you don't have any new data. And reproducible. So. If you move to a different machine, if you have a different laptop, etc., it should work the same way. Uh, it shouldn't uh, mess up uh, anything. Um, so that brings me to Delta Lake, which is, um, who of you has heard of Delta Lake? Just, okay, okay, fairly number. Um, well, actually, um, yeah, um, uh, this is, I think, th the main focus uh, of today. So um, uh, there, there, a few years ago, uh, basically Databricks, which is, which is uh, the, the uh, developer of, of Spark, basically, the original developer, um, they introduced a new data format, which is, uh, which is called Delta. And what it builds on is uh, Parquet, which is, uh, which is, I think most of you probably have seen Parquet once or twice, which is a, a column and data store which compresses data and has schema on read which is which are very important characteristics because yeah it, it, it helps uh, keep the data consistently and then they developed this uh, delta format which is basically a layer on top of these parquet files so um, let me I'll explain very briefly uh, how, how it works so there's this uh, data file which is in this case file one dot parquet that contains the actual data. So if, uh, for people not familiar with Parquet, you can compare it to a CSV. Only it has schema information attached and some, some more 
uh, interesting features. And then it adds a log that basically is saying every iteration which files are uh, part of the current version. So let's say I have a, have a table, I update something, which means a new parquet file, then there will be a corresponding JSON saying, and now you should use these uh, parquet files. And with every update, it keeps track of which files changed, why did they change, and um, yeah, which files are current. What that means, I will show in the, in the demo. Um, well, it's, 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 it's made by Databricks originally. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, Databricks is, is a closed uh, uh, Spark implementation. Uh, but they open sourced it. So, so actually the Delta format itself, as well as the libraries to read it, are open sourced. Um, and there are, there's even a standalone reader available that, that allows you to use it without Spark. So I will show you in the demo also how to read it without having the Spark. Um, the standalone data writer, so creating these files, is currently only possible through Spark. But uh, there is this uh, writer coming this year, which would then basically allow you to do everything I showed in the demo with purely Python without using any Spark. Um, and P Power BI, for example, has also a reader. So like a CSV, you can uh, put it uh, on your machine and Power BI will already know how to read these logs and give you all of the benefits of Delta. So that brings me to demo time. Jeroen, I, I was originally intending to do it here myself, but there are some technical difficulties that my laptop has to be over there. So you have to uh, think we're now uh, eh, everywhere. So uh, Jeroen, if you could run the, the first files. <laughs> so it's a, it's a demo and even on a distance. So, so I'm pretty uh, happy if this goes, uh, goes smooth. So basically, well, what I said there, Delta, it's, it's made by Databricks. It currently depends still on Spark to, to create the file. So, so I can't give this demo without uh, instantiating a local PySpark. So, so this notebook is open source. It's just the open source version of PySpark and each one of you can download it and uh, work with it. So uh, we create a Spark instance and then going down, we're gonna read in uh, some wine data, which you can see over here. And basically, um, yeah, it's, I'm showing the schema. So it's, it's a wine review data set. So there are wines, there are reviewers, there are points um, that make up a review. So yeah, we want to do data science. Yeah? So um, let's say we want to predict which wines are going to get positive reviews and which ones are going to take negative reviews. And now I'm focusing, of course, on the data part. So uh, we, we read in the data and you can see uh, there are points, price, yeah, nothing, uh, nothing special about that. Now, we're gonna create, we're gonna read in the data and then the first thing that I would recommend to everyone, uh, if you're using this way of reading in data, use a read stream to, to stream the data in. Um, I think with streaming, maybe some people will, s will think like, that's really difficult, yeah? getting things real time, etc. But that's not what we're doing here. We're actually, um, yeah, if you run the next cell as well. So we're reading in the CSV and then we're, um, yeah, the, the screen is pointing everywhere, but um, the important thing is, is trigger once. So it's just reading the stream, but it's only doing it once. And uh, the benefit is that the, you get sort of a hybrid version. Yeah? It's, it's not actual streaming where you're constantly uh, asking for new records and it it's keeps on running, but you're just doing it once. So it's actually a batch. Yeah? It's, it's just doing a one-time uh, 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 load of the data with, and that's the big win if you do it like this, with a checkpoint location, meaning that it keeps track of the files it read. So if you, do, if you rerun this now, you will actually see it will not process anything because it knows, oh, I already saw this file, so I don't need to do anything. So this makes it runnable, reproducible, and it will prevent you from waiting. Yeah? If, if there's no update, it will actually give you zero records. And of course, that will take almost no time to, to execute. So if we move on, we can, uh, yeah. And then basically, I'm, I'm from this part, if you, I'm, I'm reading in the Delta file, 
and you can see that it loaded these 180,000 uh, reviews. Then, Jeroen, can you move your head a bit? And I know the time that I have left to, uh, yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I, I don't want to keep you off the drinks. Yeah? So that's, that's important as well, because otherwise, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, looking at this uh, Spark, you can see I loaded the table. And now this is just some simple uh, command prompt lines to move in a new file. Yeah? What I mentioned, what happens, there's new data. Yeah? It's the same table, but it's new data. In this case, we get a new file, which only contains new records. Um, because we've used this format, we can just rerun. This is the same code as above. We can just rerun this the uh, these cells and it will just add these 1000 records without having to change any code or, or looking at that so you could trigger this job you can run it on your laptop and it will just automatically add any records that you need and then yeah you can show that it uh, yeah it added the 1000 lines uh, to your table yeah Jeroen, you can uh, move on yeah so now there's this thing that if you look closely, you see that we actually stored it as a delta table. So what I mentioned, the data is in parquet format, so that's just regular parquet files. But we have this added feature where if you run these two steps, you can see that there's a history attached to this table. So that's, this is actually just reading the JSON files in the log. What you can see is there's now a version zero and a version one. And there's some additional information on when it was created, et cetera, et cetera. And that means you can read this table without changing the path, without changing any settings, with an additional option of saying, give me the data set as it was with the version number or with the timestamp. You can just say, give me the data as it was last Friday. And it will automatically know which parquet files to use to give you that exact state of the data. Then. Of course, the, the, yeah, so you can already yeah, run this. So, of course, this is the ideal situation. You get a file with only new data. That's, that's, that's nice, yeah, so we can update. In reality, I've, I've had loads of times where it's not possible to get just the new data. Yeah, you just get a full table again and again because there's no incremental load process involved yet. Um, in that case, you can create a merge function, um, which basically says the, the only important bit to remember is you need to know what identifies a, a review that we've already seen. So in this case, there's the taster and there's the title, which is the actual wine that it's reading. So if the taster is the same and the wine's the same, then of course the review is the same. And if something changed in that part, so let's say that in this case, the, the score was incorrectly calculated for some reason, um, we wanna update this row. We wanna remove the old one and just insert the new line. So using this merge function in combination with uh, this um, stream query uh, will ensure that it's just updating these 100 lines in the same code. So um, yeah. Uh, th th this is what's called the update insert, so an upsert, basically, in, uh, in uh, data engineering. And um, yeah, again, it's the same code, and it will mean that you can just rerun this every time for both the new situation as well as the... <laughs> I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, you can run it. Yeah, and then uh, you will see that um, uh, you update this, and then the same thing happens. There's this history um, eh, attached to it, and we will have an additional version where these 100 lines are different. And because we have this, we can also uh, very easily, if you move down a bit, uh, yeah, take some, we have to wait until the job's done. So that we, c we have to move two up. Yeah, let's run the stream query progress. So if that is uh, if that is long, then it means the job has finished. Now it has to go through all the data. I've done no indexing or any performance tweaks, so it has to very 
stupidly go through every line and check whether uh, it's updated. So you can rerun the 28, Jeroen. And I would expect, uh, yeah, so now there's this actual uh, version two, so that's the third version, um, with other information. Yeah, it's, it's not very readable, but uh, you can actually see in the log why this version was created uh, with the update statement, etc. So it's a different sort of change between the versions than the previous one. And then using this format, using the version as of, I'll show you, you can just load the old data, new data, yeah, same path, same code, you just add the version number and you can compare um, uh, yeah, what changed. Yeah, give me the lines that are different um, and then uh, move, uh, move from there. So if you uh, move down a bit, yeah. Yeah, so in this case, uh, I'm showing one of the lines which actually went from 88 to 35. So in the same notebook, from the same data source, I read those two versions, I compare them, etc. cetera. Uh, all in very, I think, readable code uh, uh, to, to create. Then I mentioned uh, there's also the code above is using Spark yeah, as a part of the, of the package. This one is actually not using uh, Spark. So you can, uh, that's the difference between Delta and Delta Lake. The naming is of course confusing, but uh, yeah, knowing this, uh, you can just have a Python, you can pip install Delta Lake, and you can read these files and have all of the yeah, features I showed above as well, like the version number, the timestamping, etc. So that concludes my demo. Yeah, so uh, yeah, what I've shown you, um, yeah, so Delta, I think it's a very, it's, it, yeah, it's now at a point where it's pretty easy to use. Um, it, it, uh, it gives you an option to load data that, that's coming in with multiple files at different times, and as well as giving you the option to do very easily, if you get full loads every day, to do an update where your table's not exploding with uh, other stuff. Um, and yeah, you can easily query across these versions. So you also for a machine learning perspective, you can just say, uh, give me the version that I used last week to train this model. Uh, you give it a timestamp, so you don't need even need to remember which version it was. And uh, yeah, you can train the new model on the old data yeah, to know whether the, the, the performance increases based on the data or on your uh, model. Then, um, yeah, there are of course some limitations, so, so I try to cover them a bit. This is really like a startup phase yeah, of your project. Um, there are limitations of the laptop that I use, of course, in this example, or your VM in this case. Um, and I think the most important thing you need to consider is that all data versions, the way I showed it to you right now, are stored on your disk. Yeah? So basically you're duplicating. Um, there are, if, if you start partitioning, that there are a lot of ways to prevent this or to prevent it as much as possible. Um, but of course that takes more time and it makes it more complex. So, so I think in the beginning where you have limited data, let's say a few gigabytes, it's, it's not that difficult to have 10 versions of that on your machine. Uh, so uh, it's, it's something you need to keep track of. Um, if you start using far bigger, uh, bigger data sets, of course you need to go to a cluster version to, to, to scale according to the data you need. This code will run also exactly on a Databricks or an Azure Synapse. You don't need to change anything. It's the same, uh, same code. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, if you really get into big data, there are of course performance issues, et cetera, and you need to start looking at that. Well, eh, indexing, all of these things come up uh, that, uh, that you need to consider. So that's basically the conclusion of my, uh, of my talk about uh, data pipelines. I, I hope I inspired you to, uh, to start looking at this stuff. I think it's really helpful and, and yeah, we're, we're at a stage where these files will, will be able to be shared across teams using different tools, uh, etc. So I think in a few years, I hope that everyone is, is working in this way and um, yeah, using it to, uh, to uh, version the data basically without too much, uh, too much hassle. Then uh, to conclude, um, we're also doing bits of help. So uh, I work at Pipple. Um, uh, we just started bits of help, which is basically 
a, an organization that, that uh, helps uh, data scientists, data analysts, data engineers who want to do something good, uh, who, who want to do something uh, for the society, to spend some of their time on projects like the ocean cleanup, like the Red Cross, uh, etc. So um, if you're interested in these things, you feel like I, I want to contribute something to something else than just uh, uh, the, the, the commercial model, so to speak, then go to this website. Um, yeah, it, it just started, and there are quite some projects that uh, that uh, yeah that that are really data sciencey and that are uh, yeah uh, also with an impact basically. So um, yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you for uh, listening.